Hello, my name is William Plummer, and for the past 18 years, metal detecting has been my hobby and my passion. Metal detecting is a great way to get out and enjoy the outdoors, discover a little bit of Kentucky's fabulous and varied history, and perhaps get a little exercise too. We're going to take a moment today and share a few tips with you on how you can get started in this fantastic hobby. The number one thing about detecting is to always get permission for the land that you're going to be on. If it's private land, make sure you talk to the property owner. If it's public land, make sure that you know what the local laws, rules, and regulations are in your area. In terms of getting started, you need a metal detector and something to dig with, plain and simple. Most metal detectors fall in the price ranges between $50 and $2,000. My advice is to start with a lower end model. Lower end does not necessarily mean a worse detector. The detector is only as good as the user behind it and the place that you are metal detecting. This model that I'm using cost about $400 uh, 15 years ago. So it's a fairly old machine, but still works like a charm. Metal detectors outlast automobiles even. They're made pretty well. And the shovel that I'm using is an army shovel. I broke several shovels uh, digging and then I decided that I needed to uh, have something a little more sturdy. There are three basic types of places where a person might want to metal detect. First type is plowed fields. These are fields in which the crop has already been harvested in the early spring or late fall. And just about any digging tool can suffice for that. The second type is lawns, uh, manicured grass uh, around old houses or perhaps even your local park if regulations allow. And the third type is the woods like we're in today. The woods are difficult unless you metal detect in the woods in the winter time. Obviously the foliage is not going to give me much trouble today. But in the summertime it's a different story. In terms of ticks, bugs, snakes, poison ivy, it's a different, different animal altogether. My favorite places to hunt are the plowed, plowed fields in Kentucky after the crops have been harvested, but I also enjoy the woods now and then too. It's always important to remember that going metal detecting is not a right, it's a privilege. So therefore, every time we're allowed to metal detect, it's because of the kindness of others. It's important that we, as hobbyists, give back to that. We should make display cases of fines for property owners, give them some of what we find, and do everything we can to promote a good image that our hobby deserves. You know, it's amazing what you find out metal detecting. Just about anything that you could imagine and even some things that you can't imagine are actually underground waiting for you to find. And I've brought a few things to show you. These are some Kentucky State Seal buttons. Uh, they have the Kentucky State Seal on the top and then they say United We Stand, Divided We Fall around the edges. And they're gold gilded. And we found actually a whole coat of these that was uh, discarded by a 
uh, military person. These were in use probably about 1890, 1880. And so we actually found a full set of coat buttons and a full set of these little ones, these cuff buttons here. And I've given some to the property owner. I've given some to some friends where they will be treasured for years to come. Okay, I also have some buttons here. These buttons up on this side are large uh, 1700s style buttons. Uh, the people in Kentucky and in the western frontier were pretty resourceful people. A lot of times when the shank on a button broke, they made extra holes like in this one here to reattach it to a garment because they didn't have any access to any pre-made, machine-made buttons. These are pewter buttons here. One of these has initials scratched in the back, probably of an owner uh, at one time. These are probably late 1700s as well. And also from the 1700s, these buttons that are made of this shiny gunmetal colored material called Tombak. I have some two-piece buttons from the late 1800s here, and some more just general nondescript, what we call flat buttons. And then over here, this is a Grover Cleveland match safe. It's just half of the match safe in the shape of his uh, profile here. This is a um, William Henry Harrison campaign button. It says Harrison and Reform. The myth about Harrison was that he was uh, born in a log cabin, which he actually wasn't, uh, but he ran in 1840, so this is a button from his election. And then over here is an Abraham Lincoln campaign token from the 1860 election. It's not in great shape because of the fertilizer in the fields, but uh, it would have originally had a daguerreotype or a tintype photograph of Lincoln on one side in the center, just in a little circular uh, daguerreotype, and then his running mate, Hannibal Hamlin, for that 1860 election on the other side. And here we have a Louisville Expo Southern Exposition token from 1884. And this was held in Louisville. There were actually more um, electric lights in Louisville in, for that exposition than there were in New York City at the time. And these are some of the more common items that we find. Um, everyone had suspenders and likewise everyone had suspender clips back in the 1800s. And this gives you an idea of the variety of, of suspender clips that were manufactured during those years. Um, all different types. In fact, I don't think we've ever found any two the same, uh, which is pretty incredible And when you consider that there's such a common or lowly item um, that everybody had and probably didn't give much thought to. And so we see some patent dates. Here's a patent date of 1871 up here. And we see different figural things. Um, we also see a Masonic suspender clip here with the calipers and ruler. So they came in all different shapes and sizes. Okay, this is an interesting item here. This is actually a lock plate from an early percussion rifle. Uh, it was caught by the plow at some point in its past and its long sleep under the cornfield. And so it's a little bit bent. But it's a, a percussion cap rifle lock plate, and it's probably from a, what they call a Kentucky rifle, which bore a lot of similarity to the, what's, what's known as Pennsylvania rifles. So there that is. And also this other interesting piece, which is a half of a powder flask for dispensing black powder. Um, it's only the one half and not the, not the nozzle on top, the measuring nozzle. But it's just one panel and has sort of this dead game motif. There's a dead rabbit or hare and some dead birds hanging almost like uh, sort of a hunting motif on that. It's been a pleasure talking with you all today, sharing a little bit about my favorite hobby. And I hope this episode has piqued a little bit of your interest in metal detecting. I hope that in a future episode we can maybe get together and dig something up.